we're going to go through Romans chapter 10, verse by verse, and point out some things to help our soul winning. Number one, get a burden. We need to get a burden if we're going to be effective soul winners. Romans 10.1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and pray to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And if anyone had a burden, it was the Apostle Paul. He is the same one who said that if he could, he would wish himself a curse from Christ for his kinsmen according to the flesh, which is the Jewish people. And if we're going to be effective soul winners, then our heart's desire should be to see others saved. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is as a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Paul was a wise man. 1 Corinthians 9.16 Paul says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So Paul was about preaching the gospel, getting the gospel out to as many people as he could. So we have to get the gospel out to as many people as possible, even to our enemies. And just like Paul was going after the Jews who were enemies to the gospel. Something I do to keep a burden for lost people is look at certain pictures that give me a burden. I'll pull out my phone and go to the photo app and see pictures of my daughter who's two. And I look into her eyes and realize there is a soul in there that's never going to die. And it's going to spend eternity in hell or eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. So do something that provokes a burden inside of you. Whatever that may be. We need to get more of a burden and let it continue to grow. See your enemies as souls and not just as flesh. Sometimes when I'm in a big crowd, I look around and think how every single one of these people is going to end up in the same location again very soon. And, and everyone who ever lived will be at the great white throne judgment. Uh, when walking in the mall and seeing thousands of people, I think to myself, everybody in here is going to be standing in front of God at the great white throne, either doing some judging or being judged. And Christians won't be judged there but we'll be there. That's what it all comes down to. That's how it all winds up right before eternity. Because Revelation 20 and verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Let that sink in your mind. If you're not saved, you're going to be standing in front of God with a book opened. And you're going to be judged according to your works. Your family, if they're not saved, they're going to be judged. Every person you see, if they're not saved, they're going to stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're going to be judged according to their works. Remember that and get a burden. So number one, get a burden. Number two, get a proper knowledge of the gospel. If you're going to be an effective soul winner, you need a proper knowledge of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10.2 says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Talking about the Jews, the Jews were zealous, but all their work counted for nothing if they weren't saved. Just like the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and the Oneness Pentecostals, they're busy for the devil. They are evil workers. Not all wicked people are lazy. The only people who have really ever witnessed to me were devil-possessed cult leaders and followers. A man on a bike followed me around telling me how I wasn't saved because I hadn't been baptized in Jesus' name only. And the funny thing is, funny thing is he did this shortly after I was saved. Uh, he wasn't a lazy man. Uh, the devil's got evil workers. They're zealous, but they don't, have, they don't know the knowledge of the truth. And if you're going to be an effective soul winner, then you're going to have to have a good knowledge of the gospel. You need to know where 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 is in your Bible. It tells us the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. Romans 10, 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And the Jews think keeping the law and establishing their own righteousness can get them peace with God. 
However, it doesn't. They need to submit themselves to the righteousness of God. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way we can get righteousness. And when witnessing to a person, I always bring up the fact that they aren't righteous. There is none righteous, no, not one. I let them know about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. I let them know about 2 Corinthians 5.21, which says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Everything Jesus did when he was on earth was to fulfill all righteousness. When he talked to John about being baptized, he said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. One reason I don't have to be baptized to be saved is because Jesus was baptized. He fulfilled all righteousness. He came down here and lived a sinless life so that when I get saved, his sinless record could be imputed to me and my sinful record could be nailed to the tree. You need to make a person realize that their righteousness isn't worth anything and that Jesus Christ's righteousness means everything. You need to have a knowledge of what salvation is if you're going to be an effective soul winner. You are saved. You know the Lord saved you, but could you tell others how to be saved? Romans 10.4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Notice the verse said, Christ is the end of the law. Because Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness, he kept the law perfectly. When he died on the cross, it began the New Testament. And back in the Old Testament, those Jews had to keep the law and offer a bloody animal sacrifice when they broke the law. This was their own righteousness. And this righteousness that was their own was never good enough to get them eternal salvation or a spot in heaven. But it let them have access to paradise where they would wait on the perfect blood sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. Men in the Old Testament weren't looking forward to the cross. But everyone who is in heaven right now is there because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because of their own works and because, or because they kept the law perfectly. Because none of them did. Romans 10.5 says, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Romans 10.6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Notice that the righteousness of faith is faith in the gospel. And a soul winner should be able to take you to a place in the Bible where it shows you the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A favorite of mine, as I said before, is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. If you're going to be an effective soul winner, you need to be able to show someone where what they need to place their faith in to get righteousness. But Romans 10, 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? And NASA tries to ascend into heaven, but they can't get to God and they can't disprove God. If anything, what they find only further proves the existence of God, because how could something that big and amazing come from nothing? Genesis 1.16 says, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. It says he made the stars also. Just like it ain't no thing because it ain't no thing for God to make the stars. But when they ascend into heaven, what do they find? Just something that proves God's existence. If they're really going there anyway. Romans 10, 7. Or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? You can't bring Christ back up from the dead. He already resurrected. You can't find his bones. If you found his bones, then everything that we're preaching and teaching is for absolutely no reason whatsoever. But you could you could have found Buddha's bones and Muhammad's and Michael Jackson's, the people that people worship. They all went back to the dust because they were sinful flesh and couldn't resurrect. And 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If we could find anything left of Jesus Christ, of his bones or anything like that, then our preaching is vain. 
And like my pastor, Donnie Dalton, always says, I've been to his grave five separate times, and he ain't there. And the angel said, He is not here, for he is risen. And I'm glad that the Lord Jesus Christ is not there. I'm glad that he resurrected, proven that he's God, manifested in the flesh. But next, if you're going to be an effective soul winner, don't just have a burden and don't just know the gospel, but also don't overcomplicate salvation. Romans 10, 8 through 9 says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. All it takes to be saved is to, to believe from the heart on the Lord Jesus Christ to pay for your sins. If you're not saved and you got down right now and said, Lord, I'm believing on you to save me. I know that you're my crucified, buried, and risen Savior, and I'm relying on you and you alone to save my soul. If you, if you said that and meant it from the heart, then you're saved. It's believing from the heart which saves, not what you say with your mouth. However, it's silly to frown on anyone saying a sinner's prayer when they get saved. And you hear a lot of arguments back and forth on the issue. But it's just overcomplicating things. When the Ethiopian eunuch got saved, he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He said this after Philip had expounded those scriptures from Isaiah telling him who Christ was and what he did on the cross. And a man is saved when he believes from the heart that Jesus Christ died for his sins, shed his blood, was buried, and rose again the third day. And he's putting his trust in that to save him. He is saved from that moment. What he says with his mouth in a prayer or in front of a crowd of people is just an outward showing of what took place inside. And I definitely think it's great to pray a prayer when you're getting saved. For example, the night that I got saved, I said the Lord, to the Lord that I knew Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And I told him I was putting my trust in him and his finished work on the cross to pay my sin debt. And the prayer doesn't save, but what I believed in my heart did save. The prayer helps me have assurance because I remember getting down on my knees and praying that prayer. It's good for a soul winner to pray with a person who's believing in Jesus Christ because he can take him through the gospel during that sinner's prayer, making sure the person understands what he needs to trust in. And it also gives a confirmation to the soul winner that the person believed the gospel. And obviously we can't see the heart at that moment, but it gives the soul winner assurance of their profession. And you don't want to go overboard either way. You don't want to say a sinner's prayer without the heart belief. You don't want or you don't want to say a sinner's prayer without the heart belief will save because that's that's what you call easy prayerism. To say that praying a prayer, a magical prayer will save is is not right. That's because you need the heart belief. And you don't want to be so against a sinner's prayer that you just teach against anybody saying one entirely, even to the point that you say if someone said a sinner's prayer, then they didn't really get in. If the heart belief is there, then they are saved. If the heart belief isn't there, then they're not saved, no matter what they said with their mouth. Romans 10.10 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. See, the man believeth unto righteousness from the heart, and the heart and mouth are connected. Jesus said, Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And as a general rule, most people are going to say something to the Lord with their mouth or in their mind when they're getting saved. And many men say they believed they were saved when they stepped out into the aisle to go to the altar. But it wasn't the stepping out and going to the altar that saved. It was what took place in his heart on his way to the altar. If they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and made that choice to step out by faith and put their trust in him as their crucified, buried, and risen Savior, it was the heart belief in that that saved, not what they did outwardly. So don't overcomplicate things. 
Just tell a person they are a sinner in need of a Savior. Tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ and that they need to believe on Him. Pray with them. And if they believe, they're saved. If they didn't, then they're still lost. But do you honestly believe that someone who comes to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner, who's ready to believe the gospel, that the Lord is going to turn him down because he didn't ask with his mouth? Uh, do you honestly think he would turn down a sinner who did ask with his mouth? You say, well, asking doesn't save. No, it doesn't. But why would you ask the Lord to save you if you didn't believe from the heart that he would save you? Why would you ask him if you weren't willing to put your trust on him to pay your sin debt? Romans 10.11 says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Everyone who doesn't believe on him will be ashamed at the great white throne. They will be ashamed in hell when they die in their unbelief. So don't overcomplicate salvation. And don't, on, don't complicate salvation by saying certain people can't be saved. Romans 10, 12 through 13 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved so our next point don't complicate salvation by saying certain people can't be saved if you're going to be an effective soul winner then every person you see is eligible for salvation and there are many people who won't even witness to a sodomite because they believe he's beyond saving and there are men who say a man has to wait until he gets to a certain overwhelming feeling of conviction before he can be saved. But if a person knows they're a sinner, if they know they need a Savior, and they have a desire to be saved, then that's all the conviction you need. The overwhelming feeling may be stronger at times than at other times. And I remember that. I remember at times there was overwhelming feelings of being under conviction and other times not so much but you shouldn't just wait on a certain feeling if God is a whosoever God yet a sodomite or a reprobate couldn't be saved then God isn't a whosoever God because it'd be whosoever except for the sodomite and the reprobate and all these other people the sins a man commits before he's saved can't keep him lost if he wants to believe the gospel and the sins he commits after he's saved won't make him lost those things are separate issues from salvation itself and I do believe you have to have a desire to be saved and, and know that you are a sinner before you can be saved and I believe if you have those two things then you are being drawn by God to receive Jesus Christ and he says in John twelve thirty two, and I if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me John 6, 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So how do you know if he's drawing you? If you reach the point that you know you are a sinner, that you've sinned against God, and you know you need a Savior to keep you out of hell, then it is then your responsibility to believe on Jesus Christ. God's already done it. He's already... He's already died for you on the cross. Jesus already died for you on the cross. He's already drawn you. It's now your responsibility. It's not his responsi responsibility to draw you at certain different times. Because once you realize you're a sinner, from the time, from that moment until you die, you're eligible to be saved. You don't wait for a certain feeling at that point. And you can be saved now. You can do that now. You don't have to wait for an overwhelming feeling of fear. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. The Lord isn't going to draw you today and then not draw you tomorrow and make you ineligible to be saved tomorrow and then wait for a later date to draw you and give you this overwhelming feeling of fear again. For example, this one very, very famous evangelist had a sermon called something like seasonal salvation and he said a man uh, wanted to be saved but he didn't come to the altar that night and then he got in the car and told his wife he said I should have went to the altar because I was under conviction and and I needed to be saved tonight but now but now I can't 
And the preacher said the Lord waited another 23 years before he was drawn again to be saved. And that is just nonsense, just complete nonsense. And I that's one of my pet peeves I can't stand. It's like, why would the Lord wait 23 years to draw the man again to be saved? Why would he want him to spend his life in sin 23 more years? It doesn't make sense. If the Bible says today is the day of salvation, and the Lord wants you to be saved, it's not that he's drawing you one day, and then he's not drawing you tomorrow, and then he's drawing you next year, and he's not drawing you a year after that. Once you have a knowledge of sin, that you've sinned against God, and you desire to be saved, from that moment until you die, it's as long as there's breath, there's hope. But once you reach that point, when you become aware of your sin against God, you're eligible for salvation. You're eligible to have a chance to be saved. You've reached what they call the age of accountability. And many people will complicate salvation by telling telling someone it's it's just not their time yet. But it is your time. Only you know if it's your time. Why would the Lord make you able to be saved today and then not able to be saved the next day? And I've heard preachers, they'll, they'll say, well, this woman prayed all night long that she could be saved. And, and saying, Lord, I believe on you. I believe on you. Please save me. Please. And, and the preacher said, well, but, but, she had crossed God's deadline. She had rejected too many times, and the Lord just went and saved her. That is nonsense, and that's not in the Bible. But many times, the overwhelming feeling of fear that people get at church at church during the invitation has has more to do with the fear of going to the altar in front of everybody else than it does with actually being saved. But the best advice I can give you is that if you don't know you're saved then go to God about it now. Don't wait for a feeling. You say, well, I thought I needed to be under conviction. Well, remember, if you know you're a sinner on your way to hell, then you are under conviction. All you need is the desire to be saved. And if you didn't desire to be saved, then I don't think you're going to worry about being saved anyway. So that means anyone who comes to Jesus Christ as the filthy sinner that they are and puts their trust in Him gets saved on the spot. And a lot of preachers will say, I can count on my fingers the chances that you will have to be saved. And this is misleading because your chance to be saved, as I said, is from the time you found out you were a guilty sinner against God until the day that you die. Then it would be too late. And if you die tomorrow, then you don't have much of a chance left. That's why you need to be saved today. But there is no unpardonable sin that a man can commit today that would make him unable to be saved. And if there was, then you add a work to the gospel. And that's simple common sense. Because then you would have to believe on Jesus Christ and abstain from committing that certain unpardonable sin to be saved. That's adding something to the gospel. So don't overcomplicate it. It's easy. Paul talks about the simplicity in Christ. Romans 10:12 says, "For there is neither difference between for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him." So Jew or Gentile can believe and be saved. God is no respecter of persons when it comes to salvation. The sodomite can be saved. The pedophile can be saved. As long as there is breath, there is hope. And if you say a sodomite and a pedophile or any other sex pervert can't be saved, you added a work to the gospel by making it about the person's uh, lifestyle and about believing the gospel. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is a whosoever God, and that means whosoever. There is no deadlines to salvation other than death. And a person can get to a point where they are so hard that they will no longer desire to be saved, but that's their fault for their constant rejection. But still, if they did call on the Lord, He would still save them. It's their responsibility. It's the responsibility of man. It's like this. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. All sins, past, 
present, and future. He died for every time that you rejected him. And you can't sin your way out of a chance to be saved in the sense that God will turn his nose at you when you come to him in belief. He will always save the sinner that comes to him ready to believe on him. Now Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom and of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher so if a person who prays a prayer calls on the Lord out of a sincere heart how could they do this if they hadn't believed in their heart to salvation already before those words even leave your lips you already believed in your heart to salvation so don't overcomplicate salvation don't overcomplicate salvation by saying certain people can't be saved and next, get a real foot washing. Romans 10.15 says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. We don't do foot washing as an ordinance, but the Lord said you'll have beautiful feet if you preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So before you were saved, your feet were quick to run to mischief. Now that you're saved... Make the Lord see your feet as something beautiful. Help others who are using their feet for the Lord as well. It says, How shall they preach except they be sent? The Bible says those that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Give a soul winner in need anything he needs. And next, talk a little bit more about don't add rules and regulations. Romans 10.16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? And many would take this verse and say, you have to obey the gospel, and that means doing certain works to be saved or stay saved. For example, a Church of Christ uh, person may claim being water baptized is obeying the gospel. But obeying the gospel is simply believing the gospel. Because in Romans 16, 26, it talks about the obedience of faith. By putting your faith in the gospel, you're being obedient. And if you add rules and regulations as necessities for salvation, then you add works to the simple gospel. You also complicate it, as we talked about earlier. And the works a man does before and after salvation are separate issues from the salvation itself. And next, to be an effective soul winner, be a faithful reader and hearer of the word after salvation. Romans ten seventeen and 18 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. A person has to hear the gospel from you or another person before they can get saved. Maybe they see it on a billboard. Maybe they heard it on the, on the radio, read it on a tract or somewhere else. But they have to hear the gospel or, or read the gospel to place their faith in it. After salvation, the more you hear the words of God, the more your faith is going to grow. Jeremiah 23.18 says, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Romans 10.18 But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Every person at least heard about God. They've heard about God at least through his creation. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And when a man acknowledge God and seeks the truth, the Lord will then send a man to give him the gospel. And that's where missionaries and people like that come into play. And next realize there are people who won't believe and don't get discouraged. Romans 10.19 says, But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. I will anger you. So Israel was provoked to jealousy by the Gentile nations. In Romans 10.20, But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. After the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, the Lord went after the Gentiles. They then found the Lord and were reconciled to God. And 
Romans 10, 21, But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands into a disobedient and gainsaying people. Just like the nation of Israel is blinded, disobedient, and gainsaying people, there are many people who won't believe the gospel the first time you knock on their door or the first time you give them a tract. You just have to realize that you are planting a seed and that the Lord can still save them even after you're dead. But this has been tips on how to help your soul winning and Romans chapter 10 verse by verse.